seen the hardworking guy running around back and forth between both the rooms, tending to the video cameras. Uh, he's actually producing discs of all of the lectures. So if there's a lecture that you particularly like, it should be available for sale in the vendor area, something that you want to maybe bring back for coworkers to listen to or something you just want to, you want to watch Dan drink the, uh, the beer and uh, apple cinnamon crunch over and over again, you can do that. Or if there are two talks at the same time that you want to see, but you can only in one room at one point in time, well, there's a solution for you. Just buy the disc of the other talk that you missed. And we're live? Uh, OK, we're actually kind of waiting for the speaker. So I'm stalling for time. How much are the discs? Yeah, so $20 for a talk, um, it's actually incredibly reasonable. And he, he has these things available almost instantaneously, or at least as fast as the duplicator can crank these things out. So you can pretty much almost walk out of a talk and be able to, uh, to, to buy the disc shortly thereafter. So, and I, I guess uh, we're getting ready to start here because we've got our speaker back who does not have the drink in his hand, but hopefully it's good. Cool. Right, uh, what do you want? Yeah, but what kind of alcohol do you want to have? Vodka. Okay. Okay. All right. I apologize. I didn't mean to offend your, your gentlemanly sensibilities. <laughs> so we're going to get started here. Uh, coming up next, we actually have Jay Beal, who's going to be giving you his spiel and eventually probably might let you know how he feels about his project in Linux, Bastille. So uh, Jay Linux ta is talking about OS X. Hey, just came up with that. That was well um, done. <laughs> I'm sure I could have come up with a couple more, but time is of the essence already kind of cut into your lecture a little bit. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jay Beal. Okay, so welcome to Discovering OSX Weaknesses and Fixing Them with Bastille. And I really am not going to rhyme anymore because that would have been really painful. Uh, those sores would never heal. Um, if I can do this throughout the entire talk, I think uh, you guys owe me at least a round each. No, it's not going to happen. So what I want to start out with is, to, is, is looking at OSX security, is looking at basically you know, what happens when I unwrap my shiny new Mac and I say, oh my god, I, I've paid all this money, but I've got this operating system that's beautiful. And, and they told me there was lots of Unix underneath. And so it was rock solid and stable and secure and all this. But my apps will also work. And I've got this awesome desktop manager. And, and, um, and I've been on a Mac for a few years now. And, Whenever I get a new one, or whenever I get the newest version of the operating system, I kind of do a little bit to check it out. And, you know, it's definitely improving, but what I want to show you is some of what, surprises, what, what surprised me when I looked at it. And this talk was very much motivated by, um, this talk was very much motivated by uh, hearing about someone who got uh, hacked at ChmooCon and, um, and saying, why would they be hacked at, why would they be hacked on the Mac? I'm, I'm sure the firewall's great. And I went and started taking a look at it, and what you're going to learn here in the first half when we're talking about OSX as it stands is, is what I learned. And then after that, I'll talk to you about how, to, how you can fix it. Cool? OK. So we're going to start out with the firewall. We're going to start out looking at the firewall. So you know, the first thing you do is you, get your new, you open up your new machine, and you're like, wow, this is a beautiful, beautiful machine. And you open it up, and if you're like me, the very first thing you do is you pop up a shell, and you start investigating. OK? And I start looking. You know, I look at file permissions, and I look at like the firewall what's listening on the network, and I say, okay, let's see what my shiny new laptop, my you know, very much client workstation operating system is doing and offering. Okay, so I open up my laptop, and what's the very first thing I notice? Oh my god, the firewall's not on. Okay, now, now this may seem surprising to you, but, but it's not. Maybe, I don't know how the Windows people feel about this. I think you guys actually get to laugh at Apple at this point, because, you know, you've got a default firewall on now. Everybody does, except for OS X. Um, so, you know, your firewall's not on, and if we wanted to, if you all wanted to find out how many people's systems weren't on, we can look at the set of open ports that are standard. We can, like, you know, go and run an Nmap scan against the entire wireless network. I'm sure Simple's about to start as soon as he finishes his drink. And, um, and, and we'll see, oh my god, it's full of stars. Okay, well, it turns out that in talking to people at a security conference, um, I went around and I talked to different people at 
conference, including a lot of the speakers. And I said, hey, can I see your Mac for a second? And they showed me their Mac. And what I found out was about one-fifth of, one of the speakers at a conference and a lot more of the non-speakers at the conference had their firewall entirely off, just didn't know that they had to turn it on explicitly. OK, everybody kind of expects this thing is really on. Uh, if anybody's, if you've got your Mac out right now, go check and see if you've turned the firewall on. If you don't have your Mac out right now, check if everybody else's is on. Um, so we can go and turn the firewall on. Thank you, sir. Ah, caffeine and vodka, very good. Um, so anyway, we can, go and, we can go and turn it on. When we turn it on, I pop up my shell and I say, show me the firewall. And what do I see? Well, this is what I see. Now, I know not all of you read firewall ACLs, but you're at a security conference, it's time to start. Um, this is what we see. I, I've made it a little bit easier on the newbies here. The part we don't like is in red, OK? So I can look over this, and the first line says, I let everything in from local host. The next line says, I don't let in things that say they're from local host that are really from off, off the network, and I don't let in multicast. And then uh, I let TCP all the way out, and then I let incoming TCP that's established but what do I do after that? Okay, I reject all the TCP that all the all the TCP connection attempts. Okay, all the new ones that aren't established. And then what's that last bit? That's a line you never want to see at the end of a website. It says allow. Allow what? Allow IP. Oh, all IP. Okay, so this is what I've got as the firewall when I turn it on. Now you're going to say, Jay, surely you can configure this, and I'll say yes. Oh, unless you're on Panther. Um, if you're on Panther, this is the end, okay? A few of you are on Panther. If you're on Panther, this is the end. Your firewall doesn't have any kind of UDP blocking. It doesn't have any kind of ICMP blocking. It doesn't block anything else you might call inside of IP. Anybody think they could have fun with that? Okay. You guys awake? Okay. Cool. Just making sure. Just making sure. Okay, so for those of you who don't have Panther anymore, this is good. You're on Tiger. The difficulty is until you click that little advanced tab on Tiger, you don't have any kind of UDP filtering. You don't have any kind of ICMP filtering. Now, I know some of the newbies in here are like, uh, what's UDP? Um, for reference on UDP, please see Dan Kaminsky's past talks. Done. Okay, so, so you've got so you don't have UDP. Um, well, the weird thing is, you don't have any UDP filtering, you don't have any ICMP filtering, and most of us aren't expecting that. Again, when I went and looked at the speaker laptops, when I looked at participant laptops, and I said, can I, see your, can I see your laptop? Can I see what the rule set is? They'd show me, and they'd be like, wait, there's no UDP blocking? I'm like, no, there's not. Well, well why isn't there? Well, because that's an advanced feature. And they're like, advanced? <laughs> it's UDP. I mean, it's, you know, we get the TCP, we get the UDP. A whole bunch of fun stuff happens over DNS happens over UDP, time sync happens over UDP, all kinds of really fun protocols happen over UDP. What do you mean there's no firewalling on UDP? Nope, there's none. Okay, so you click the advanced tab and this is what GUI pops up. Okay, this is your GUI. It says uh, you're not blocking UDP, but it gives you these three options. The first one is do you want to block UDP traffic? The next one, do you want to enable firewall logging? Always a good thing. Logging is good. Most boring area of computer security is logging, but sometimes the most instructive, especially when you've just been pwned. Um, anybody look in their logs, they see a long string of A's. Yeah. <laughs> you just might be a, a pwned. Um, anyway, so enable stealth mode. There's this wonderful, okay, we're going to come back to each of these, but let's look at each one of these. So if we click on the advanced tab, the problem I'm going to have is I'm going to show you what each of these things do, but the advanced tab doesn't actually do what it says it does. Okay, the firewall doesn't really, doesn't really, doesn't really deliver what it says. Okay, that means it's either means the GUI is either deceptive or far more likely, it just means the firewall configurator designer doesn't really know so much about TCP IP, okay, or security or either or both. Okay, so suppose we were to click on the block UDP traffic box. What do we get? We get some bad rules. Am I going to make you read all these rules? No, I'm not going to make you read all these rules. It's okay. But here are some of the rules. These are the first ones we saw previously, and here's the new ones that have all been added. Okay, our, our firewall is doubled in length, but what's weird is that it's doubled in length. Why are there all these exceptions? We'll talk about the exceptions. I'm not going to make you read through line by line, because then you'd all fall asleep, and that'd be really bad. Okay, you're already drinking, so you're either going to have a lot of fun in here, or you're potentially going to pass out. I'd prefer the former. Um, so, so what's the first thing? This is the juicy thing for me, and some of you are already configuring Nmap right now. Okay, this says the system 
accept any UDP packet as long as its source port is 67, which means it's a, which means it's a DHCP server, or it's coming from 5353. Say you're a DHCP server, you can walk right through all the UDP rules. Hey, that, that's kind of nice. You could attack any, U, any UDP service as long as you fix your source port. Nmap minus G for all of those who are using our port scanner. Fix your source port, port scan the room, you'll be able to find the OSX laptops real fast. Okay, so what can you connect to, UD, what, can, what can you reach on UDP anyway? By default, this is what you get. You can talk to the NTP daemon. The NTP daemon? Yeah, the NTP daemon. You can talk to the printing daemon, cups. You can talk to Bonjour. And then you can talk to whatever else pops up. I've noticed that when I run Microsoft Word, it listens on port 2222, okay? Uh, but normally that's, you know, I, I, t I was talking to somebody else at the conference today, and I said, hey, Word listens on 2222. I'm not sure why, but it does. I'm going to ask Microsoft people, what's up with that? And they said, it's okay, it's protected by the firewall. And I said, <laughs> and you. I know how to fix my source port. HPing, Nemesis, Nmap, these all do source port fixing. It's very easy. Heck, Netcat does. Okay, this is, this is very nice. Okay, so I can get to NTP. There have never been any vulnerab vulnerabilities in NTP, have there? Uh, here's my list of the last three. Okay, the first one was a group promotion weakness, not too juicy. The next two are remote overflows. Remote overflows. Game root on the box, game over. Thank you very much. Thank you for playing. This is my box now, not yours. Okay, what else? Okay, I can also talk to CUPS on UDP. This is really weird. I don't know why, but CUPS on TCP on these listens on localhost. On UDP, listens to the world. But don't worry, it's protected by the firewall. Okay, so we've got, we've got vulnerabilities. There are 32 vulnerabilities in CUPS listed, listed in OSVDB, the open source vulnerability database. Shout outs to those guys. Um, now, you say, Jay, come on, how lame are you? You didn't bring any exploits with you. I mean, you know, at least the cool guys have those wireless exploits, and there's all kinds of, yeah, I didn't bring O'Day, or at least nothing that I'm sharing with you guys. Um, but suppose other people brought it. I don't know if they did. Maybe Simple's packing? I'm not sure. You brought the right O'Day with you. There are a whole bunch of apples on the, on the network. Believe me, I've already checked. Okay, you can walk right through their firewalls as long as you've got O'Day and the right stuff. Well, in anything that listens on UDP, you're, you're in. Good luck, have fun. Okay. So the UDP blocking is pretty darn unimpressive, but let's look at one more thing. In that rule set, we had a default allowed to cups anyway. There's a firewall rule that says, hey, we'll let you into cups no matter what. You can always reach cups. Even if you don't do that source port fixing, they already drilled cups. What they, what they drill a hole for? I, I you know, if, if I look at my configurator and didn't tell it I was sharing my printer, I didn't ask for a hole to be drilled in the firewall to anything, much less to printing system. This is my workstation. Most of, most of Apple's machines seem to be workstations, right? I, I don't know that they're really in the server market. A print server's, this should get turned on if I said I was sharing, but I'm not sharing, so what the heck? Okay, what else? There's a default allowed a bonjour. Okay, bonjour, bonjour is also rendezvous. It's also been called zero conf. It's this wonderfully chatty, welcoming protocol that will tell you all kinds of stuff about a system. It says, hey, I've got all this stuff to share. And uh, Apple actually makes really good use of it. Apple's amazing at usability. Their systems are so awesome, easy to use. They're so awesome to use. I love them. I adore them. Don't take this talk as an attack on, their, on them because their stuff's really great. I just want their security to get better. But, but zero, conf, zero conf bonjour, we're going to talk about it, but there's a, there's a hole drilled in there. And you can't remove the hole. You can't remove the hole to these two things unless you go and make your own firewall rules. You can't do it. There's nothing in the configurator to do, to do it. Okay, we're going to come back to UDP blocking, but let's look at this other advanced function. Okay, the other advanced function is something called stealth mode. Okay, your Apple has a built-in stealth mode. This is so badass. Okay, look at this. Enable stealth mode. Ensures that any uninvited traffic receives no response, even an acknowledgement that the computer exists. Stealth mode's got to be the strongest freaking firewall. Stealth mode's got to like close all those other holes. Stealth mode's definitely got to get rid of the holes to those two things, and it's got to definitely fix. I mean, stealth mode should be pretty amazing, right? I mean, stealth mode, okay? <laughs> this is stealth mode. What's it do? You click on enable stealth mode, okay? And it's and and here's us clicking, and we can scan our target. The UDP port scan shows. 
change in behavior. If I were to port scan, I see no change in behavior. None of the UDP holes have been closed up, nothing. You can definitely get a response out of those out of UDP ports. You can definitely get a response when you end map and do a UDP scan. Okay, so maybe maybe they just weren't thinking about UDP. Maybe it's an ICMP thing. Okay. What does ICMP do? ICMP scan, pings no longer get through. You can't ping this Mac anymore. No, it took advanced function to turn off ping? Okay, but fine, you can't ping it anymore. The thing is timestamp requests, netmask requests, oh I don't know, these are the other two ICMP ping options in Nmap, so they're kind of well known. These still walk right through. Well why? Stealth mode added one rule. One rule. What's the one rule? The one rule is it says, listen, nothing can come in if it's a ping. If it's an echo request. Echo requests denied. Everything else, talk about Magino Lion, man. Okay, everything else, timestamp request, everything. All the other ICMP allowed right in. So you can do anything but send a ping. That's a pretty badass stealth mode. Okay, so timestamp requests, nmap minus PE, netmask requests, PM. You can still find all the apples on the network. Feel free to try. Um, have fun. Okay, so let's remember when I say that when I say that this is either deceptive or at least the person doesn't understand TCP IP, and I, I do mean like the whole thing, not TCP. Okay, I meant it. I can get a response. This is not a stealth mode. Ensures any invited traffic receives no response. I can get a response with two different types of ICMP. And I can do it with, with easy UDP packets. Okay, so you're all thinking, listen, Jay, everybody knows this. Is this really new? Everybody knows this. Thank you, Rich. Gentlemen, Rich Lindbergh, clap, please. Rich will be seeing you at Security Opus. Um, so, so you think everybody, you think everybody knows this who has a Mac, and the thing is, actually, most of us don't. And there, are, there, maybe it's a usability thing. Maybe the system's just so easy to use we don't look. But we're security people. We go to conferences solely about security. And I'm telling you, most of us don't know this. Most of us haven't looked. Most of the speakers at your security conferences who are carrying Macs around, you know, they don't know this. And lots of them even had, you know, 20% of them even had their firewalls off. That 20% number is pretty, you know. But really, I mean, people just, we just didn't check because we were expecting a lot more out of a Unix. Okay. So this is the rest of the firewall rules. I'm not really going to go into them too much. I'm not going to go line by line, but I'll, I'll bring up a couple more highlights. You can see in yellow that these are the lines that are interesting to me. Okay. I'll let you take a good long look for just a sec. Okay. What holds? I've got rules that open up a few more holes. I've got a rule that opens up a hole for a DNS server that I'm not running. It says any packets are allowed in as long as they're destined for 53. Okay? Um, I've got a hole that opens, that opens up access to my print server that I'm not sharing. I've got a hole open up for SVR lock, for, for SVR loc, which is part of Bonjour, and I don't see anything listening on the port. I'm not sure why it has to be there. Maybe it's offered by the kernel. Anybody know? Any Apple kernel hackers in here? Okay. Um, and I've got something open for Samba. I've got something, I've got 137 open up for Samba. I haven't told Samba that I'm exporting shares. I haven't tried to mount anything and I've got a hole open already. What's up with that? The GUI's not giving you a new firewall, a good firewall. The GUI isn't giving you a good firewall, but the nice thing is, this really is Unix. You really can roll your own. You don't have to write any custom code. You pop up a shell prompt. You sudo up to root sudo and build your own firewall, and you can build your own thing. Now I'm going to show you Bastille, and Bastille comes with a firewall, which is, which is configurable. There are also a whole bunch of third-party things you can download, but you can really do it pretty easily. If you wanted to right now, if you're kind of racing the people who are port scanning, I know the port scanning is probably already over. Some of you have moved on to exploitation. I don't want to know about it. Um, but for those of you that are racing to, like, wait, I could be number six in this guy's list. I still have a chance, right? Um, well, you go through and literally delete the firewall lines that are opening up the holes. So here are two commands, here are the next four, and you've kind of started to clean up your firewall. Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. My bad. Okay. So um, I'm also going to give you, I'm also going to put up Bastille after this talk, and you can use its firewall. Um, I'm going to talk about a few other Apple security issues. How are we doing on time? Yes. Real quick before you move on. Real quick before 
When in the boot process, the question is, when in the boot process are the IP firewall rules set? And if you wanted to delete them instantly and replace them? Answer. This is really embarrassing. I'm going to say it in a room full of people, so I'm going to take a drink first. I don't know. I have Googled. I have Googled, and I just can't find out. As far as I can tell, it, 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 it's got to be something kernel or whatever. I don't know. I don't know where this rule said. I, I've been able to find. I've been able to find the configuration file where this is stored. I can't. I can't figure out how to reverse engineer a configuration file to go and remove things. I can go and add new holes, but I can't necessarily make it exactly what I want. I don't know what's building the rule set. So, with that said, again through more googling, I found out that everyone who's bi who's built rule set has basically done this. You create a new whatever you want. System starter, RC, um, launch D. You pick. I chose system starter, so has everybody else that I've Googled. And you basically just put something else in that's going to get started on boot, and that something else will put new rules in. And those new rules override the original. Those new rules override apples. After that, the configurator doesn't try to screw with you because it says, oh god, you've changed something. Once you change something, their configurator gives up. I would bust but I understand that that's a reasonable thing to do. It's actually hard to go and suck in a faro rule set, make sense of it, and decide what to do. Um, that's not so bad. It's not that hard, but it's hard enough that I, I'm not going to fault them for it. Okay, let me move on. Bonjour. So you've got access to Bonjour in every system. If I had to pick a port that I would interrogate first on, if I had to pick, well, this is kind of probably the first one. One of the first ports I'd interrogate on any Mac, if I was just port scanning, I found one, and I was like, hmm, evil and, you know, I don't know how illegal, so I'm not going to do it. But if I was interrogating something on my own Mac and trying to figure out what other people could do to me, I talked to 5353. It's allowed from and everywhere to everywhere. The system really wants to get traffic on 5353. What do I find out? There are a few things I can find out. The very first thing I can find out that kind of scared me is I can find out your OSX security update level. What does that mean? Well, it's kind of like knowing what patches you got installed. Okay? So that means I can figure out what patch bundle level you're up to. And that tells me whether or not you're vulnerable and whether I should spend my time trying to exploit you or not. Okay, well, anybody been to DEF CON? Raise your hand if you've been to DEF CON. We really do have a lot of newbies in here. Okay, DEF CON is this wonderful thing called the Wall of Sheep. Everybody remember what the Wall of Sheep is? The Wall of Sheep is this nice little scrolling list of all the passwords, of all the usernames, and part of the password that was captured by sniffing traffic off of wireless. Oh, and Bluetooth too. Um, but they capture off wireless and they man in the middle where they can. That wall of sheep, and every so often you see people's pictures up. Like a couple years ago, there was a picture up of a guy and it said, I am a Cisco security engineer or something like that. Okay, so the wall of sheep is always fun to watch, and before it, now it's on video, but it used to just be like this, uh, it used to be on paper. Like people just walk up and be like, uh, this guy, this password. And it's really scary the people whose names ended up on there. There are lots of unencrypted protocols, you sometimes don't realize you're using them. Anyway, I've got a new kind of, I've got a new kind of, of wall of sheep. It's of patchless sheep. It's all the people I found on this conference network that weren't fully patched. We could just put it up. Okay, that's not hard to do. We just talked to 5353. What else do we get? Next, if we talk to Bonjour, we can find out your machine name. This is kind of nice because often these machines are named after the first account created on the system. So when I like, you know, when I when I interrogate it and it says Simples G4, I'm like, oh hey, I think I know who to take a picture of who's unpatched. Okay, so that's very useful for the wall of sheep. And then lastly, I can get your machine hardware type, which now that we have two hardwares and we've got, well, we've got G3s, G4s, and we've got the new Core Duos, we've got different versions of the Core Duos. So if I want to tune my exploits to your particular, if I want to tune my shell code to your particular machine, I, it'd be good to know what your machine architecture is, which might also be useful if I'm going to put you on the wall of sheep. Um, so, you know, we could have some fun with this. Bonjour is very friendly. There are lots of applications which can tell you a lot by Bonjour. It's, it's really nice iTunes, these are all like sharing. Okay, what else? Bluetooth. Okay, I always look at the Bluetooth configuration on a box. By default, I take my new Mac, I create a second account on it as I always do. I think it happens on the first, but I don't have any virgin OS X systems right now. Um, but you know, I take it and Bluetooth's on. Okay, this is set on a per user basis. So if you create a second user, that second user is going to have it on by default. Um, what else? The machine's marked discoverable. What does that mean? 
means uh, I pop up my little machine and I start, I pop up my machine, I turn on Bluetooth and I start finding Macs in the room by another method. Okay, the encrypt encryption's off, user auth is not always present. This is Bluetooth for a new user. Okay, go right here, turn it off, make it non-discoverable, do it now, please. Okay, what else? There are three more issues, weak user security. The first one is, look at this, I run ID, it says I'm user J. Okay, I walk into slash users, I do an LS, and I look at LS of one of the other users, of this user called New Blue. I can see in his home directory. Turns out the UMask on the system makes it so that I can actually walk in and read all the other file, read the files of every other user on the system. Luckily, there aren't too many multi-user systems here. But, you know, I don't know, you may have a family member who wants to see all of your files uh, that you may not want to share with. So this may not be what's great. You may have a coworker that's on this, that has an account on the same system. This isn't, this isn't what I love. Auto logins on by default, okay, well, you know, that's pretty common, but it's still, I'd still like to see a little bit better. What else? The first user on any Mac system, Okay, this is the Trojan horse risk. The first user created on any Mac system basically owns the applications, owns the applications folder. That means they can Trojan any, they can Trojan any application on the system. Okay, you're like, well, why do I care? I don't have a multi-user system. Well, the reason you care is you started up with your non-root first user account. You said, I'm not root, so I can't really do any damage. If my browser gets, if my browser gets bitten by the next vulnerability in Firefox, sorry, that's no problem. What are they going to do? They're getting one user. They're not getting root. Actually, they're getting a lot more than that. As that one user, because it's the first user, first user is an admin user. First user can replace everything on the system. Okay, so all of you are going to right now, those of you who haven't created a second user, you're going to create a second user, right? You guys are going to, please? You're going to, you have already. He says he has already. Okay, so you're going to create a second user. And that second user is non-admin. And when you want to install software or whatever, you'll type your username and password and it works really well. And you're going to do that. The problem is you still end up with a problem that your software gets, that the software that you, you know, gets owned by that user. What does that mean? Well, all the stuff that that user installs can at least still, can still be Trojan. It's better, but it's not perfect. This is just, this is just me complaining. So I'm done with complaining. Let's talk about what we can do in terms of defense. Okay? So Bastille and OSX. I'm going to give you tonight a beta. I will tell you the beta doesn't break anything. The beta is a beta because I don't have an installer for it yet. I have a shell script installer, but I don't have a fancy schmancy installer yet. Oh, and one other thing that you'll see later, which is that you've got to start up the, thank you, you've got to start up the, you've got to start up the front end and you've got to start up the separate, the, the back end separately. But here's Bastille for OS, here's what Bastille for OS X does. Who's heard of Bastille before? Okay, most of you, this is good. Then I won't, I won't get too far into it. But Bastille can audit the system, it can harden a system that and then you can go and re-audit it and make sure that the system after a patch is still strong, okay? That audit's basically a hardening assessment. It'll actually say, this is the stuff you could harden, okay, that isn't hardened. You can be like, wow, I should fix that. Then you can fix it, and then you can re-audit. Now, what I want to do is tell you a little about what Bastille, what Bastille OS X is doing. Okay, so some of you say, wait, Bastille OS X, Bastille, they're the same thing. This is Bastille Linux for OS X. Uh, Bastille's this... Bastille Linux is this increasingly misnamed piece of code that runs, that like gets installed by default on HPUX nowadays. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's still called Bastille Linux because that's what we called it. Um, Bastille has been one of, the more, one of the most popular hardening and audit tools for about six years now. Um, it ships in HPUX as part of the installer. If you install an HPUX system now new, I know only so many of you do, but those of you that do, Bastille is actually part of the install process. You can select a security level. Um, you get all that, that's on HPUX because a bunch of guys at HP did the work on the clock, and that's really cool. Thank you, Hewlett Packard. I hope you figure out what's up with your board. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get so sued. Um, or at least uh, have people grab my phone records. Um, so Bastille is available for most of the major Linux distributions. Um, we're now extending support to OS X Tiger. Um, the only thing is the, the front end right now is still X, which is a pain in the butt. If anybody like makes Cocoa apps, I would love some help. Um, uh, we're going to put together a small team of people who hopefully, hopefully can make us a new front end in Cocoa. Um, you can get in the credits. It'll be fun. You can come up and talk about how you made it work. Um, that's what I got. We're, we're free software. I don't have any money to offer. It's just credit. Yeah. Um, anyway, credit in groupies because you, know, you get lots of groupies in open source. <laughs> Sorry, that's the vodka talking. Okay. Oh, 
That still works on these whole bunch of Linux distros, HPOX, OSX, Tiger. Um, the cool thing about Bastille, listen, people, people thought Bastille was really cool because when it first came out, instead of just hardening a system, it would, actually, it would actually let you choose what to harden, but more importantly, it would tell you why you wanted to do things. It would say things, you know, it would go through and tell you, this is why you might want to do this, this is when you wouldn't want to do it, so people could, people could know why they wanted to harden, and they could do it without fear because they wouldn't have to worry about what's going to break if they do a hardening step. So we added auditing a couple of years ago with the help of the Navy, um, and we put in auditing so that Bastille could tell you what should be hardened. That means that shops that don't want to do this automatically, well, they can do it all by hand, but at least something's telling them, giving them a good list of stuff that isn't done yet. Okay. The other cool thing is that when you teach people, you help them make better decisions for security. So I, I like that. Now, that teaching component was our, was our really, really unique thing. Now our really unique thing is we teach and we'll both audit and Okay, that teaching thing was like, you know, it's like, okay. It says, hey, turn off Telnet. And you're like, no, that's how I administer my systems. And I'm like, no, 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 turn off Telnet because it's an unencrypted protocol. I can sniff it and I can take it over. And you're like, oh, uh, screw Telnet. I'll use SSH, right? Why did we do this? I like to say that we do this to make the world a better place. We wanted to educate people. Other people might tell you that it's probably because Jay's a control freak. We did it because he wanted you to do what he said. Um, well, okay, whatever. Um, that joke never goes anywhere. <laughs> so anyway, Bastille's actually been really, really good because it breaks exploits. Um, hardening breaks exploits. A good example of hardening breaking exploits is putting a better firewall on a system. Okay, you can't get to cups, so you can't, you can't get to the NTP daemon. So if they have zero-day vulnerabilities, I don't necessarily have to worry about you hitting them, right? Okay, so that's one example of how hardening breaks vulnerabilities. The other way, configuring things so you configure things to make them harder to break into well sometimes exploits don't work because the code they needed to get at was off that code was unreachable because they didn't have the permissions they needed or the or it breaks because the for the exploit to work it needed to have root level privilege and the things running is not root or something's truded or whatever so hardening actually breaks exploits and I normally talk about this a great deal more but I'll just say we made Bastille before Red Hat when Red Hat 6 first came out we made it for Red Hat 6 before anybody had the ex before any of the vulnerabilities that came out. And we just basically did normal, stupid best practices and a, cool, a few cool ideas of our own, but mostly just you know normal, non-rocket science stuff. And it turns out we broke basically every major exploit. Every remote exploit against Red Hat 6 was broken by Bastille. It doesn't mean Bastille's really cool. It is. But it's, it's that, thank you, um, it's that hardening just works really well. It doesn't get lots of press because it's not that sexy. Well, I mean, it's a little sexy, but you know, not too um, but, you know, it works really well. Um, there have been a bunch of tests of hardening. NSA's IAD, Information Assurance Directory, the people who are in charge of trying to make sure that our computers don't get broken into, um, basically took a, stood up a Windows system and they said, okay, 95% of the exploits that, wor that, that worked before we hardened didn't work after we hardened. That kind of stuff, you know, call it a 9 in 10, yeah, it works pretty nice. I'm, I'm happy to take that. I'm happy to take that. It gives me much better odds at a conference. Okay, so. Bastille does this hardening assessment stuff. Um, it's got this, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Bastille and then I'm going to take your questions. Um, but Bastille does this hardening assessment stuff, which is a read only, and it basically says, this is how well the system's doing right now. The system is, this system's really, really well hardened, but you should do these two things. This system is horribly hardened. You should do all these things, right? That stuff's actually useful for a few reasons. The first is triage. Triage. What do, you mean by, what do I mean by triage? Well, you got 100 systems. And you know, you're going to go a hardening. Which one do you harden first? Okay, out of those hundred systems, these three are the red-headed stepchildren that have never been patched, never been hardened, nothing. It'd be nice to find which three they are, okay? That's triage. Okay, what's the other reason that's really, what's, what's one of the other reasons assessment's nice? Motivation. There was a, there was a, we were doing one of the first auditing tools, one of the first assessment tools. I know, I got to not say audit, because audit sounds bad. We made one of the first scoring tools for Unix, and we gave it to a, we gave it to an, to to a conference speaker, and that conference speaker said, I'll beta test your tool, and we're like, thank you. And he ran the tool on his own workstation, and it came back and said, six out of 10. And he said, what the? And he got all kinds of upset. He got red in the face. He didn't see himself as a six out of 10 kind of guy. That's a D student, screw that. And he sat down, and 15 minutes later, he hardened the system a whole bunch. And he ran it again, and it said 8.5 out of 10. And he's like, okay, B plus, I'll take that. We motivated him to harden a system simply by giving him a bad grade. It's a 
45-year-old guy, he's been out of school for a while. We gave him a bad grade, and he went and bettered his security. Okay, I'll take whatever method I can get. Okay, so the other reason this assessment stuff is good is skew detection. You run Bastille, you harden a system. You harden a system really well, it says, okay, nine out of 10. And it gives you all the things that are hardened and not hardened. You patch, you use the system for a little while, you go back, you say, I wonder if it's still just as well hardened. Well, okay, run the assessment tool. The assessment tool comes back and says, six out of 10. These are all the things that aren't hardened anymore. That's skew detection. Now you've got some kind of, you know, little way of detecting things that have come unhardened. Well, that works pretty well. Um, it's a pretty useful thing. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go into all the individual things that Bastille does. I will put these slides up on the website. What I'll do instead is I'll show you a Bastille run. How's that? And then if you guys ask me, I'll tell you what Bastille does, but you know, we should leave some time for questions. I've run Bastille. Like I said, it's an, it's an X, it's an X based tool. It, it, the, the GUI's in X, the GUI's also in curses. Um, yeah. X is supplied by Perl TK. Perl TK is not entirely perfect, but it works well enough to make Bastille run. Uh, Perl TK is perfect everywhere else. For some reason, I can't make it work perfectly on the Mac. Okay, so to get Bastille on, you've got to put Perl TK on your system. Our fancy installer package will, like many other things, install Perl TK for you if you don't have it. For everyone who downloads Bastille tonight, you're not going to get the Perl TK. You're going to have to go get it yourself. I'll put up instructions on the site on how to do that. Okay, so here's our, here's our front end GUI. And the way this GUI works is, I'm not sure how much you can read the text. It's okay, I guess. You've got a list of modules, which is basically groups of questions. And then you've got this main screen. There's a question, and there's an explanation, there's a place for your answer, okay? The question says, well, do you want to do this thing? The explanation tells you why you might want to and why you might not want to. So we can go through and we can kind of just say, okay, so we've got this thing and it basically just asks a bunch of questions. This says, do you want to turn off set UID to ping? Um, set UID, good for turning off for privilege escalation. Most of us aren't too worried about it, but I've seen a number of systems rooted from privilege, privilege escalation just from finding vulnerabilities in set UID utilities. So you can choose what you want to. We go through and just turn off a bunch of the set UID stuff. And it says RSH, and do you want to turn off set UID, this and that. The next thing says, do you want to make it, thank you, we're down to five minutes, okay. So the next thing says, do you want to, do you want to make it so that do you want to make it so that users can't see all of each other's own files? Now, it says UMask, but that's what UMask means. So we can say, yeah, we want to set it so the users can't all read each other's files. And it says, um, do you want to password protect single user mode? I'm choosing no right now. Um, it says, do you want to put up a really TCP, TCP wrappers rule set and then tune it yourself later on? And I'm going to say no for now. It's going to say, do you want to put up authorized only messages that pop up at login? And I like that. Okay, it's gonna say, um, it asks me who owns the machine, it asks me about doing, uh, preventing local DOS, um, and it says, do you wanna turn off the NFS client daemons? Do you wanna turn off zero conf? Do you want to, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go right through these and choose the defaults. Well, let's turn off Bluetooth. Okay, oh, Bluetooth is a default. Okay, so I'm turning off, I'm configuring Bluetooth better, I'm turning off cups, and I'm installing a better firewall. And it says, do you want to shut off access to Bonjour? Yes. I click that one button, Bonjour is no longer accessible. I don't have to worry about everybody else in the network finding out everything they'll find out from it, which is good. Because, well, then I'll put my machine on the network later, because it's not on right now, because I don't trust you guys worth a darn. OK. Well, I'm sorry. Here, let me put it on. Um, <laughs> OK, so um, what else? I can, I'm getting rid of. No, no zero conf access, get rid of TCP. Um, gives, asks you, what TCP ports do you want to leave open? What are you running? Are you running an SSH server on here? You just put in a list. So let's just put in 22 and say I'm running an SSH server. It says, what UDP ports do you want to leave open? And it comes with the default of 137 for Windows file sharing. So I'll leave that there. And then it says, what do you want to do? So I'm going to click on save configuration. And now I've got this button that says apply configuration to system. And now you find out the other reason we're in beta. Okay, when I click on this, the config file is written to the system, but it's not acted upon because for some reason the front end can't launch the back end that actually makes the changes. That's fine, no big deal. You run Bastille minus B. Okay, I was running Bastille or Bastille minus X. Okay, you run Bastille minus B. That's the thing you run if you were to create a config 
on one system and copy that config file to 100 other systems, on those systems you just run the back end. You just run the part that does the work. You don't have to run the GUI everywhere to make this thing work. So I run Bastille minus B, and it says, okay, I'm doing the hard thing. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five. Okay, so call it five seconds later, and I'm done. My system is hardened. Okay, um, what do I get out of that? Now, I haven't, my PFW, I haven't booted the system yet. I'm not going to reboot for you guys, but I will start up my firewall. I said I'd start up my firewall. Well, that's funny. The demo gods have struck again. I, 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 I. Okay, well, let's look at what the firewall would have been. Here's our Bastille firewall, okay? This is what the firewall would be if it ran. I'm not sure why it's not exactly running. Um, but this is what our firewall rule is. It just puts in a new firewall, and that new firewall basically gives you what you were expecting in the first place. If you ran Bastille on your system tonight for nothing else, I'd just say no to everything except for the firewall and just put a better firewall on your system. Because really, you deserve one, okay? That's it, I'm gonna take questions. Uh, yeah, in the back. Rich Lindbergh has just asked, uh, when we ran Bastille with the minus B switch, was that the Batard switch? <laughs> Simple, am I allowed to let out the truth about Batard? Batard is vaporware. There's a simple nomad at the last security opus conference, back when it was called Interzone West, threatened a tool called Batard Linux. Using Bastille's own APIs and whole infrastructure, Bastille's really, 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 really easy to add on to and he thought he might add on to it in a special way, which would be to create an attack tool that would own systems and make them less good, using our very own libraries. I'm still waiting. Okay. Another question? Over there. Have I ever run a system offline? I've never run Bastille with my system offline. Normally, networking's on before I guess it's on before the firewall's up. That's weird, interesting. Um, yeah, it just, I mean, I've run this firewall four times today because I, I, the demo gods are very cruel and mean. And the only way to notice that, the, the way to, best way to find that out is to come up here. So, you know, feel free, stand up here and try to show somebody something you've done eight times today. The demo gods will strike you down for your ego. What? Okay. Uh, really? Yeah. Hey, look, I got a firewall. I got a firewall. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure why I didn't have a, why it was, well, I didn't not have one. It was just kind of slow. Anybody know what the word race condition, words race condition mean? Anyway, yes, question right there. Sort of off topic, what's the status of Bastille Live CD? We've threatened to create a Bastille Live CD, and the idea of the Live CD is that it'll run that assessment mode by itself. You, you have a system you're not allowed to modify in any way, you pop in the CD, you boot from it, you run Bastille. Um, live CDs are harder than I thought. <laughs> With that said, um, I would be happy to accept anybody's instructions on how to turn Nopix STD or, um, or honestly, the, the, the well-maintained bootable CD of your choice into a Live CD for Bastille. The only secret is it has to be something that's being actively maintained so we don't have to worry about, a, about an unpatched system, about an unpatched live CD. Okay, next question. Yeah, right there. Is Apple aware of the deficiencies that the... Um, awareness. I believe that Apple has awareness. I've talked to them a little bit about it. Um, I will not speak for their plans. I will not speak for Apple's overall awareness, okay? I think that, I, I firmly believe that the next version of the operating system we see is going to be much stronger. I firmly believe that, they're, that they will address not only these firewall issues, but that their next firewall will be much stronger and their next firewall configurator will reflect a little bit of, will reflect not only the criticism, but also the thoughts of their security people. Their internal security people are definitely very, very bright guys. Um, so I very much,
next version is going to be a lot better. I'm, I'm very, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, in the back. What's that? Have we done this for OS 10 server? The, an the, the big answer is we have not done it for OS 10 server primarily because nobody that's working on this right now has OS 10 server. Um, it's an operating system that's pretty darn expensive. Should anybody have an OS 10 server that we could use for development? That means we need root access. We need to make things go down and come back up and reboot and so on. Um, we'll get OS 10 server. We've got a couple people who've threatened to give us that kind of access. Anybody steps forward and does it, we get OS 10 server. We get OS 10 server support. Any other questions? Yeah. DNS works in that config. Guess we'd have to find out. No, I'm on the network. Where's Dave Maynard? Where's Johnny Cash? Are they in this room? Are they anywhere within range? Do they have a good antenna? What's that? Uh, maybe. <laughs> What's that? Yes, DNS works under this firewall. Yeah. Okay. Hey, where are my slides? Slides. Slides. <laughs> Come back, slides. PowerPoint may not work in this configuration. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. Maybe it's also living on port 22.2. We should find out. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to look. Any other questions? Cool, cool, very good. Well, go forth and harden your systems or, or at least fix your godforsaken firewalls. Goodbye. <laughs>